We're continuing on with the Sermon on the Mount. Is this is okay? Okay, so it's been pretty, pretty amazing. I think it's been a blessing for me to study through it and reflect on it. So um, Jesus continues. So it, last time he ta- the last thing that we talked about was a treasure. You know, where do you put your treasure? On earth or in heaven? On earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, or against heaven. And then he continues on. He says, the eye, of the eye is a lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light, is, light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Okay, so the metaphor here is, is pretty obvious. Like the eye is the lamp, or some people would say it's like the window is a source of light, or something like that. Um, and when the lamp is bad, the house is dark. So the imagery here is like, it's blindness. It's... it's, it's It's not saying that the inside of your body goes dark, but in a way, the bad eyes, the whole world actually does go dark, I guess, right? All you experience is darkness. I mean, in a literal sense. Um, I don't, how many of you guys had LASIK surgery here? Okay, a few of you, a few of you, okay, that's good, congratulations. (laughs) My wife, Sarah, told me that um, LASIK surgery is the fourth best thing that has ever happened to her. Number one is Jesus. Number two, they, she found our church. Number three, it's kids. <laughs> Number four, LASIK. I hope I'm in the top five, though, you know? <laughs> she didn't really... But then, you know, when the kids, actually our kids enter teenage years, yeah, she said I'm now number four, so that's good, yeah. <laughs> <Woo. laughs> but LASIK's still above me, I don't, okay. So during LASIK, um, she told me there's the scariest part. Okay, first of all, the scariest part is like there's a laser cutter or whatever, and then they keep on telling her there's a red dot that she's looking at and goes, do not look away, don't look away. And then the the laser's like, don't look away, right? And she's like, oh my gosh, and she's thinking like, what if I look away? And then then the most frightening part is that there's a certain part in which like they do something and they take the lens out or something like that, they take some part of the eye out, and then... Even though her eyes are open, it goes dark. Everything goes dark. And she said that only is a few seconds, and then they put something back in, and then you see light again, but then she goes, you know, there's this, you become momentarily blind, right? Yeah, that's the feel. That's, Jesus draws on the imagery of darkening eyes, which was actually a very common problem back then, to make the point about the dire consequences of spiritual spiritually bad eyes. You know? So throughout the Bible, you, know, you guys understand that there's been many warnings against what you see, starting from Genesis chapter 3, where Eve saw the forbidden fruit and started to project characteristics and qualities onto that fruit that it never had, such as it's good for wisdom, like how does a fruit have that? The Bible has many warnings, have been warning us that eyes have a disproportionate power over our lives. I mean, if you think about it, just even kind of in a nerdy way, like eyes are so small, but then you, that goes bad and then the whole world disappears, right? It's like, Whoa, you know? Um, and because we're kind of visual creatures, human beings, right? So, so the lesson is basically, what you take in with your eyes is very important. I think that's the bare minimum obvious lesson there. Of course we understand this. You know, what you see, it affects your whole life. You know, we understand this in a kind of a painful way too. The images that you took in through the media, through internet, do they just stay in the moment? Do they just stay in the eyes? Or does the images burn themselves into your mind? It enters your heart, it affects your whole body. Your body becomes dark. They start to color everything, how you interact with other people, how you see yourself. Indeed, how great is the darkness, you know? These warnings apply not just to bad images that you saw, but I think, that they, we, I think we often fail to appreciate how much of our value system and our desires, our internal desires, get formed by what we see. I mean, you know what, ad agencies are not dumb. They don't spend billions of dollars because to, to no effect. Even though teenage, in, my, in my teenage years, I thought, like, I don't get affected, come on, man, you know, ads, I know it's ad. But man, our desires get affected. What you value gets affected, you know? I, don't, I had this experience of when my kids were, when they were little kids, they, kind of, they didn't grow up with TV and, and watching TV and things like that, so then they didn't see that many ads. So during Christmas, right before Christmas season, um, we 
took, took them to um, Toys R Us, and you said, anything you want in here, under 20 bucks. You know, it's like, <laughs> anything. But there was an obviously most popular, I forgot, it's not, it's not Tecomi Elmo, it was past that, but it was something else, something Elmo, something. And everybody was like, going crazy over it. it like people, you were selling on eBay for like hundreds of dollars and things like that, right? So you just, everybody knew, right? But they didn't know, they didn't see ads for it. So they walked up to it, looked at it, hmm. and they just moved on <laughs> because they, nobody told them that that's what they're supposed to want. So it was really interesting. They were like, hmm, you know, a book here. <laughs> Some, some, like, some My Little Pony or whatever, like some, something that's rainbowy. Like, okay, I like that, you know? I just picked up a few items and said, okay, well, what's going on over there? I don't understand. And then she just, they just walked out, and that was it. Wow, they didn't know that they were supposed to want that for Christmas. Of course not. It shapes your desires, right? What you take in through the eyes, you know? So what kind of eyes do you have? If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. It says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now this money, the word money here is mammon in Greek, mammon. And it basically means riches or stuff. It's not just money. It's not just like cash. Like it's stuff. You cannot serve God and stuff at the same time. Well, some people will disagree with this stark statement of Jesus. They will say, "This is Jesus, you're being too much." They claim that they can serve these two masters fine through some arrangements and adjustments of life. You know, you can serve God on Sunday and serve money and stuff for the rest of the week. That seems to work out. Can be devoted to God with lips and be devoted, because it talks about devotion, right? Be devoted to the one. I can be devoted to God with my lips and be devoted to money with my heart. Or I can do a really balanced, balanced 50-50 share, you know? I will love God with half my heart, half of my strength, and half of my mind. And I will love money with the other half. Seems like it's possible. Can't we do that? Well, Jesus disagrees. Jesus says no one can serve two masters. No one can. He says that's impossible. You know, why? Well, let's think about this. You know, what's money? Because money is actually more than just a piece of paper, right? Money and possessions, of course, they mean so much more. It's, it's not just like potential to buy stuff. I mean, it, it means... So much more. It, it means your self-worth, maybe. A lot of times it does. It means that you're respected, that you matter, that your life mattered, if you have a lot of it, if you succeeded. And it promises certain things. Money promises security. Money promises peace. It promises freedom. Wow, all the things that God promises, I guess. Significance. You know? Money even ends up becoming equated with love. And this is the scary thing. Like, I think... Many of us actually kind of equate money with love because you say, I need to love my family. I need to take care of my family. Well, that means I need to have enough money, right? So that I can buy more stuff for my family and leave money for my children so that they can buy whatever they want. So that's like money is like, that's how I love. So it's equated even with love to give, I mean, that's, Sounds like a non-selfish plan, you know, to give money to the children and that being a high lofty goal. I mean, is that a good plan? Could be, I guess. You know, a lot of people kind of justify the chasing after money in terms of like, I want to provide for my family and give it to my children and those kind of things. But, you know, Ecclesiastes actually has something really interesting to say about that. Ecclesiastes says, who knows what the money, like what that money will do to your children? He might be an arrogant fool. And if that's the case, then money will ruin him more. 
right? Like, so, so you got a lot of money, and you go, here, give it to my children. And then, and then the children happen to be like really foolish and have, be filled with folly. I'm not talking about dumb foolish, but just filled with arrogance and folly. Well, that money ruins them even more. And you've seen that happen, right? It, it only enables our foolishness more. We've seen that happen plenty of times. So do not underestimate the power of money. You know, you know I didn't think that I struggled with greed for stuff. Actually, when I was, when I was an undergrad, when I was growing up, I never actually owned that much stuff. I, was, I, was, I came from a pretty, you know, pretty poor background with subsidized, subsidized apartment, you know, live, living in kind of the government subsidized housing and stuff like that. Never owned that much stuff. But, and I never dreamed really of owning that much stuff. But, man, like... When I, got a, when I graduated and I got a job, and then the paycheck came, I was like, whoa, okay. Hmm. And then I you know, gave that away and you know, tithed and you know, gave it to church and those. And then third, second paycheck, third paycheck, fourth paycheck. And then I was like, whoa. And then you know what I started doing? I started doing something I never did before, which is window shopping. I know that you don't understand window shopping. You guys are only looking at like browser shopping now, right? So, Window shopping, it's like, I actually look down on people who went window shopping. I would, I would go, why do you go to the mall, not know, like, just to look at stuff that you can, like, you know, just look at, wow, why, like, why do you do that? Boring. But then I found myself doing it. I was like, because I was like, I can buy that. Well, I can buy that. And I can buy that car, that car. <gasps> you know? So, so I was like, wow, that's really powerful. And then I started to it, it, it detect that my view toward God started to shift. Like he became a little bit threatening. Service to church became a little bit annoying <laughs> and threatening. And I was like, whoa, what is happening here? You know? So, college students, youth students, before you have money, you got to make prior decisions now. You have to make decisions. Don't think like, ah, you know, let's see what happens. You got to make certain decisions now and certain vows now. What your life is going to be about. What your life is going to be devoted to. Who is it going to be devoted to? What is a matter of devotion? Right? It's about, is it about being devoted to God or is it going to be devoted to stuff? To stuff. This is one of the characteristics, I think, of our church that we really should not lose. At our church... You know, you guys experienced it. It's hard to tell who makes a lot of money and who doesn't. Some people are doctors and engineers in the tech field. Some people are admin. Some people are teachers. That's like the difference of, of salary is huge. But you can't really tell by looking at their stuff, right? So I think that's, I know, you know why. Because we're really trying to devote ourselves to God and not to stuff. I hope that we would never lose that distinctive as a church because I think it, it speaks volumes, it's, it's, it's a testimony of the, our devotion and who, how much, how worthy God is. You know, so, anyway, so why does Jesus draw such a line, a distinct line between money and God? I mean, I mean we can do multiple things though, right? You, I can double major, right? You guys can double major. You guys can like basketball and football, right? I can love both of my kids. Or it doesn't have to be like, either love her or love her, and you will despise the one. Like, what do you mean despise? Like, you will love one major and despise the other? No, not necessarily, right? So why does, why does he make such a distinction here? Well, he actually tells us. Because those double major, two interests, and those kind of things, it works in, in, because it's interest. But when it comes to God and money, they're not interests, they're not hobbies. They are two masters. And you end up serving that master. It's a master-servant language, master-slave language, actually. You know, they are masters. You, you end up serving God or you end up serving money, and they will have authority over your life. I think you have to recognize that. Does, do, you not, do you recognize that money actually will have authority? A div- almost a divine authority over your life. It will determine your dreams. It will tell you what your future should be like. It will determine where you live, what you will move for, where you will move. It will determine what friends you hang out with. 
they all get determined by money. Or they get determined by God. I guess then the question is, do you recognize that God has that kind of authority over your life? And it's not merely an interest, hobby thing. Jesus is saying God has that kind of authority. Money will have that kind of authority to determine your life. You can only serve one or the other. You know, that's how Jesus saw it. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. What do you mean? How, how do we despise this? And I just wanted to kind of, before I move on, I wanted to briefly comment on this. Um, <clears throat> when you devote yourself to serving God, you do become suspicious of money, actually. <laughs> you know, you can feel the claws digging in, like, let's say there's a windfall of money. I start to worry, you know. Yes, yeah, Sarah was a lawyer, I was an engineer. There was sort of a windfall, not a huge windfall, but pretty significant windfall of money because of stocks and things like that. And I'm like, uh-oh, because I felt the, the claws not digging in yet, but it was like, you know, like, like a horror movie. Like, it was like, oh, whoa, 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 you know? I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. I hope you do. You know, where you feel that, oh, I know what this can do to me, actually. And then you start to feel a little bit of worry and you start putting money at an arm's distance and maybe even look for opportunities to give it away. You know, so some people look at that kind of suspicions toward money and career and they'd say, "Why, gosh, why do you guys hate success and career? Why do you treat it like it's something evil? Well, we don't think it's evil. But I can see where such criticism can come from because we... I kind of beat, we kind of beat it down. If you're serving God and money comes to you, you have to go like, you, you, you know, <laughs> you got to beat it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can't like go, oh, wow, you know? You're like, whoa, whoa, okay. I'll, I'll take it, but don't come too, too close. Don't come too close, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> that's sort of how we feel, you know what I'm saying? And then people look at it and go, whoa, why, why, do you, why do you treat it, look, treat your career with contempt? not contemptible. I can see how you can see it that way. But when you serve money, eventually the opposite happens. The way that you will serve money is, of course, going to be shown as how, like you prioritizing career. Right? In other words, what you end up moving for, where you end up living, the weekly schedule, what your weekly schedule looks like, it will be all to maximize, ultimately, not all, but like pretty much the priority would be to maximize your career. And as you do, do that, you know what happens to how you see God? You was first to experience God as an annoyance. Like sort of like, fine, fine, I'll go to church. Eh, gosh, okay, I'll go to church. You know? And serving God will become kind of threatening because serving God has this annoying tendency to open our eyes to different needs. That's pretty irritating. You know, I have my career and money, and then there's all these needs that I'm seeing, like, oh, man. And then you start to kind of avoid them, and it, feels, and it makes you feel guilty. And even, maybe even start to feel like God is a source of guilt trip. Like, this is not, I don't think this is healthy. You know, I'm feeling just guilt. This tension is going to be there unless you go to the, health and wealth gospel, which is, well, you know, that's one way, actually, to get rid of this tension and nullify what Jesus is saying here, I guess, right? You combine the two. Serving God is serving money. Like, yay, it solved it. Yeah, that's health and wealth gospel. But unless you go to that route, the tension is going to be there, and you will put God at an arm's distance, and you will treat God with suspicion. You know, so maybe it's very clear who you're serving, you know, as you kind of look into your heart. Who do you serve? Who's your master? But sometimes it's hard to tell, especially if you grew up in the church and grew up with the self-conception that you need to somehow serve God and maybe you've, you've even put on some spiritual language on top of it. I'm going to serve God by making a lot of money so I can have some kind of platform to influence the world and et cetera, et cetera, you know? Well, hopefully this verse can give us some clarity here. You will love one and despise the other. So maybe the question is, which one do you hold with suspicion? Which one do you like, put at an arm's length now? 
you know. So, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Man, it says, we've been talking about, so, do not be anxious about your life. That, we have been actually talking, um, the staff and your leaders have been talking about this whole issue of anxiety for, yeah, you know, we've been talking about the level of anxiety that's been on the rise, you know, since 2017, anxiety has actually overtaken depression as the most common mental health issue for Americans. New York Times reports that more than 50% of all American college students report being overwhelmed with anxiety. Um, and this meme, actually, the, uh, Pastor Ed kind of shared this with us, um, says it all right here. You know, me trying to excel in my career, maintain a social life, drink enough water, exercise, text everyone back, stay sane, survive, and be happy. Yeah, this is Cruella DeVille from 100, 101 Dalmatians, right? That's haunting, yet it's so true, you know? Who can relate to this? Kind of, yeah. So we really need to hear this, right? It says, therefore, though, therefore, that's what it says. So what does that mean? It means there's something, it's, it's in conclusion. Well, what came, be, what came before that? Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. So what he's saying, so right before this, say, saying this, Jesus actually presented to us three forks in the road, three pairs of, no, three pairs, yeah. Um, three forks, so treasure, is it in heaven or on earth? Eyes, is it good or bad? Masters, is it God or money? Right, he actually kind of presented to us these three forks, and Jesus is actually kind of assuming, well, I'm going to assume that you chose God, and then he's saying, therefore, don't be anxious, okay? But if you didn't, if you don't choose God, if you choose, chose to put your treasures on earth instead of on heaven, then you will be anxious and driven by fear. Of course, because treasures on earth gets destroyed by moth and rust. So your accumulation has to outpace the destruction and the decay. Of course you'll be anxious. But Jesus says, if you, but if you put treasures on heaven, it will not deteriorate or depreciate. You know, if you invest in heaven, when you, are, you know, when you are careful with what you take in with your eyes, when you choose to serve God as your master instead of stuff, then the exhortation, do not be anxious, is for you and for us. It's not, all, it's not that all of our anxieties simply magically disappear, um, but now we have a reason to not be anxious, and you can struggle not to be anxious. And he gives us the reason. Right? He says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? You say, this, you know, answer this question. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And your answer is, of course, yes. It's, of course, it's more than that. Easy to agree. You know, partially because we don't worry about food and clothing, I guess because we're not seriously worried about not having food, right? We're actually, we worry about having too much food. That's what diet, you know? Oh my gosh, diet, that, that causes me anxiety. I gotta cut down food. But back then, you know, these were real anxieties of people, you know? They were going from hand to mouth, basically, uh, living day by day. They're worried about like, what, what are we gonna eat? Things like that. Today, we feel anxious about different things. I guess if Jesus were to come to this, our, our modern crowd, maybe he'll say like, okay, do not, do not be anxious about, and then he would list a whole different things. Like, what should I major in? What GPA will I get? That midterm that I just flunked, will that, how, that, how will that affect the rest of my life? Should I just drop everything and concentrate on studying? What occupation should I have? Whom will I marry? What kind of a career should I get? Is my resume good enough? Oh my gosh, right? It's all these Anxiety, they seem to be kind of different from food, water, and clothing. But as I thought about that actually kind of deeper, it turns out that even those modern day worries actually kind of collapse down to these basic things. You know, so much of our desires and worries and anxieties is, is like stuff like, will I have the right career? Will I, will I end up having enough accumulated goods and stuff so that I will have enough food, enough clothing, 
to last a lifetime so that I won't have to worry about any of that. When we, when we say, well, I want to be comfortable, it's so that I don't ever have to worry about those things. You know, so the question, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Man, we need, I think we should answer that. Is not life more than your GPA? Is not life more than your school, your job? Yes, I, of course, right? Is not life more than that? What worries you right now? But we say yes, of course it's more than that. But how come then the thought of not maximizing the option of being able to eat, drink, and wear whatever we want is such a deathly fearful thing? How come that thought just paralyzes us with fear? Even in the richest country in the history of the world, we're still worried about it. We're still driven by it. Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothed, Clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So the solution Jesus gives is like, look at the birds, consider the lilies. Really? You know, like, come on, like, we're, we're worried about, like, resume. We're really worried about our future and, like, anxieties and Am I going to be rejected? What about my parents who are sick? I mean, these are real worries. And Jesus says, look at the birds. Come on, you know? <laughs> is, what is Jesus doing? Well, world-renowned theologian Helmut Thielik comments this way. He says, when this man says it, he goes, that seems ridiculous that Jesus is telling us to look at the birds and consider the lilies. But when this man, when Jesus says it, whose life was neither bird-like nor lily-like, whose mission in life was to die a horrendous death on the cross, and he knew it when he was speaking this, when this man says it, we better listen. Because he's not saying, hey, come on, smell the roses. He understands. I mean... His, if, his, if anybody's life was going to be filled with worries and anxieties and fears, it was his. First, Jesus says, look at the birds of the air and consider. So look and consider the lilies of the field. I think this actually um, turns out to be a very practical advice to um, overcome anxiety. Um, anxiety often goes into a feedback loop. So this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit of psychology here. Anxiety often goes into a feedback loop because you start to become aware of your anxiety and then you start to feel anxious about your anxiety. So it's sort of like, oh, oh I, I feel anxiety and then you go, oh, no, no, I don't, I don't want to have an attack here. So, so it becomes a feedback loop So because you, you sort of cave in into your own feelings. Jesus says, look outside, like, look out, you know, look at the birds, consider the lilies. So I, I guess that one way to think about this is like, look outside. Look outside of the whirlwind of your feelings. And that's really important. You know, when, when we find ourselves filled with worries and anxieties, especially in today's culture, man, you know, so much of it is sort of like you're in that feedback loop. Um, but look outside. Look beyond the whirlwind. Look at others. God provided the church for us to do that. We can look and consider how God has sustained not only the birds and the lilies of the field, which he, he himself says, those are nothing though. You know? But you know, we can actually look at other people who have, might have gone through that similar thing or look and consider how God has sustained this person, that person. Look and consider how God has taken care of someone who's even going through a catastrophic event like cancer, look and consider. 
You know. Second, Jesus is not talking about don't plan for anything. You know, he's not talking about Hakuna Matata. Do you guys know Hakuna Matata still? Like that's like old school Lion King. You guys, okay, somebody, whoever knows that song, sing it. Sing the lyrics for us. Ready? Hakuna Matata. What a wonderful phrase. Okay, Hakuna Matata. Ain't no passing craze. Ain't no worries. Is that what it goes? For the rest of your days. Okay, it's a problem free. Okay, thank you. Okay, stop. Okay. <laughs> We're like, yeah, that, is Jesus basically doing a Hakuna Matata on us? <laughs> Don't worry, man. Just like, he's saying what? They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. That seems like saying, like, they don't do anything, just, just relax. No, actually, he's not talking, he's not giving us a lesson to be lazy. He's not saying, therefore, don't farm. Don't have a retirement plan. Just sit back and relax because God will feed you. Because the way that God feeds the birds or clothes the lilies is not through some divine hand coming down at the birds with, filled with food, you know? And then the birds are sitting there, you know? No, the birds feed themselves. They migrate south before the winter hits. They build nests before they lay the, lay the eggs. So we, we're not talking about planning or doing something. He, he's actually warning, he's not warning them about planning or doing something. He's talking about the internal reality, the way that we feel as we do these things. Remember, he's talking about anxiety, right? That as we do these things, as we carry on our days, and that's how he's going to actually finish this parable, by the way. He'll talk about how to take care of the anxieties of today. But, you know, he's saying as we live our lives or farm or sow or reap, you don't have to be fueled by anxiety. It doesn't have to, be feel, it doesn't have to feel that way. But we think, well, anxiety is the fuel for me to plan, you know? That's actually, I would... <laughs> All the procrastinators, you know, I admit, like, anxiety is a powerful fuel, you know? Because you're like, eh, and then until you get stressed enough, you're like, boom, and you're like, all right, anxiety did it for me again. Thank you, anxiety, right? It's a powerful fuel for me to plan, but anxiety is like, somebody, somebody might say anxiety is how I get up in the morning to get the warm. You know, the birds, if I were a bird, <laughs> I would get, the thing to, to get me, the early bird gets the warm, right? So for me, I get up in the morning to get the warm because I'm anxious that other birds will eat it before me. That's, that's how we get driven by that. You know, we get driven by so much, of, uh, so much of our activity gets driven by anxiety. Jesus says, no, but that's not how it works. Look at nature and learn some lessons. They're not driven by that kind of anxiety. In other words, there is a way that we can do these things like farm and get ready for tomorrow and plan even for tomorrow without the soul-killing anxiety. And he asks the question, and he starts to unpack that. He asks the question, are you not more value of more value than they? Doesn't God love you more? Doesn't God treat you more value as, as of higher value? Of course you're more important to God than birds or grass. So one of the steps to get out of anxiety is to remember that you have a Father in heaven who loves you. That does not mean that your future is guaranteed, though. Some of your future might go wrong. You might go through some times of uncertainty, but remember that God loves you. Life is more than those things. And you have to look and consider these things. Well, you say, eh, not very helpful. I don't like it. I don't like what Jesus is telling me. Look and consider. Okay then, go ahead and be anxious about it. What's, your, what's the alternative? Go ahead and be anxious. And he says, and which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? probably took away several years of your life by being anxious. Right? He says, do not therefore, therefore do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat and what shall we drink and what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. You know, eat, drink, and wear. Notice this, eat, drink, and wear. That's the same thing that, that was a source of anxiety, right? And here, this is a very important move here that, that we need to understand um, that would provide a solution for like, how do we actually like, 
not be anxious about our, about our lives. He actually links what we are anxious about with what we seek, right? What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Okay, so listen, like, they, the Gentiles seek after these things. They search after these things. Their life is all about these things. So, of course, they're going to be anxious about those things. So here's the key. What do you seek in your life? That's what you will be anxious about. Right? I mean, that seems to make sense. What do you seek in your life? What, is, what are you searching for in your life? What do you devote yourself to? It goes back to the whole master thing. Who do you devote yourself what to? You, what do you devote yourself to? That's what you're, you're going to be anxious about. So if you're anxious, you need to find out what you're seeking and be honest about it. I think another way to put it is what you're anxious about is maybe what you seek in life. What is so important to you so that you would seek after that. So, you know, how do you do that? Well, it says, you know, do not, therefore do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we eat, where? Um, I think that's kind of interesting. Like, when you're anxious, there's a certain... This is, again, practical advice here. How do you... When you're feeling anxious, this is actually part of the counseling, like, techniques here, but you're supposed to actually not simply go, oh, I shouldn't be anxious, I shouldn't be anxious. You're supposed to figure out what you're saying to yourself. Um, it's called a schema, or or the uh, deeper the deeper belief or the automatic thought or whatever it is, right? So there is a sentence that you're saying to yourself. So find that out. He's saying, you know, you're, these people are being anxious, saying, "What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we?" Yeah, that is what they're gonna say to themselves, even though they might not verbally say it or audibly say it. What do you say to yourself? Maybe it's something like, "Oh my gosh, you know, everyone is looking at me and judging me." My friends are going to reject me. I'm going to live alone for the rest of my life. I'm going to be a loser without a promising career. Like those words. And then recognize, wow, like, is that what I seek in my life? Jesus says, for Gentiles, non-believers, seek after all these things. Seek after all these things. That's what you're going to be anxious about. You know, godless people seek after all these things, and Christians are supposed to be different because we're, we have a Father in heaven. How tragic it is then that so many Christians seek after exactly the same things that non-Christians seek after. You know, I know that all these worries and anxieties feel real, they seem urgent, but, but when you live seeking after these things and, ang and feeling anxious about these things, we, we have to understand we're living like practical atheists. So I want to challenge you. You know, when, you, when things become stressful. Well, I want to challenge you in a hopeful way. Like, when things become stressful and when difficult times hit, don't act like everybody else that faces those things. There is a chance for you to shine for Jesus. If you are not crushed by those same anxieties that crush people who do not believe in God, then you can shine the light of Jesus. You know, so... How do you do that? How do you, again, um, you know, Gentiles seek after and your Heavenly Father knows what you need them all. That, that, and your Heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So this is another thing that we can actually realize or fully embrace to calm our anxieties. Um, that your Heavenly Father knows. It's kind of interesting. He doesn't say your Heavenly Father will solve it all. He says, your Heavenly Father knows that you need those things. You know? Now, our anxieties might not fully be needs, but I think, I, I mean, some of them are. Some of them feel, definitely, subjectively feel like needs. But what if, this is the power of it. What if tonight, somehow after this, you're thinking about all, all your anxieties, like, oh my gosh. And those are real anxieties. Those are real fears. You go home tonight, and you're about to go to sleep. And somehow, just imagine, it's kind of weird, but 
an angel appears to you. He appears, and you're like, oh my gosh, right? And then the angel says this to you. He just says, he knows, and then disappears. <laughs> what does that mean? Yet, there's something very powerful about that, right? He knows. Your father knows. Right? So remember that. Remember. And so solution to anxiety is not simply to try not to worry. That doesn't work. Ultimately, the solution to anxiety is to change what you primarily seek. Because remember, what you seek after, what you search after, is a source of anxiety. So the solution to anxiety about your life is to actually to change what you primarily seek. He says, but seek first. Notice this. The Gentiles seek after those things, but seek. Now he's like, this is a solution. Jesus is going, this is a solution. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What is, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Your kingdom come, your will be done. This is, it refers back to the, to the whole, you know, Lord's Prayer. To prioritize that in our lives, to, to, to have God's kingdom come and God's will be done. You know, what does seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness look like? Well, you know, Frank, very briefly, it looks like ministry. Right? Instead of seeking first all my worries about tomorrow, instead of seeking to store up treasures on earth, we're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, meaning concern. We're concerned about, our, about your own personal obedience to God and sins that grip you, that, to, to, that, that you need to repent of and seek God's righteousness. Also concerned about the sins of other people that we're called to love. Like that, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, all, suddenly, instead of seeking for like, my own protection, you're going, okay, seek first the kingdom of God. That means... Your worries, actually, and anxieties won't disappear and you suddenly become a Zen person. Actually, it turns out, when you seek first the kingdom of God, your worries and your anxieties sort of shift to a different category. Okay, so the goal and goal of Jesus' life, and what he's saying in Sermon on the Mount, isn't like, if I, if I really obey this, I become this like, um, you know? Like, no anxiety, like, I feel nothing. You know, it's, it's, we're not talking about that. That's not what Jesus, how Jesus' life looked like. That's not how Apostle Paul's life looked like. Anxieties and worries shifts to worry about other people, about the condition of the world. You know, as Apostle Paul said, and apart from, he said, and apart from all these other things, there is a daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. He's saying, in ministry, my anxiety, there is anxiety for, the, for other people, for, my, for the churches, for people who fall into sin. My worries go there. Right? We become worried about the state of God's kingdom on earth, by condition of the church, concerned over friends struggling to make the decision to follow Christ. And it's a sacred worry. And all these things will be added to you says, right, um, when you put first things first and you seek God's kingdom, we do end up becoming more secure about our own needs and our lives. We do end up actually experiencing peace about that, which is what we're going for anyway. And that's the testimony of a lot of people. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, the final verse of the, of the, of the chapter. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious. I mean, this, man, like, so much of our anxiety is about, like, bringing tomorrow's worries. Like, worries travel. They do time travel. Okay? Here's, here's my concerns and trouble for today. Do not let like, the tomorrow for tomorrow be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So here's my daily trouble. But then there's tomorrow. There's tomorrow right here, right? And then there's a day after tomorrow. There's a day after tomorrow. And then you, you have those worries too. And you're like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring all those worries. They take time travel to today. And then you, you stuff it. And you're like, ah, ah, you know, it's heavy. Now you feel so heavy. 
The point is that we have enough troubles for today, that today's now. So, and our anxieties would have us take all the future nows, not only for tomorrow, but actually all the possible tomorrows, right? I mean, this is kind of getting like really crazy, but that's how our anxieties work, right? Like, not only tomorrow, but like, what about this? What about this? What if, what if, what if? And then you have these branches of tomorrow, and you're like, oh. And then you bring it all in, and you get all stressed out about it. You have trouble today. He's saying sufficient, sufficient for the day is today's trouble. It's its own trouble. You need to make, you, you have some decisions that you need to make today. You have problems that you have to take care of today. So handle it today. Be faithful to the people that you're called to love today. Resist temptations that you have today. Instead of thinking about all the future temptations and all the falling into despair and all of that. So what are the worries and troubles for today that you need to take care of? Even for big, gigantic tasks that we, have, that we need to do for multiple days and multiple months. Even as we think about the fall and the upcoming semester for the college students and the college staff. That causes anxiety too, right? But that's a sacred anxiety, actually. <laughs> Praise God for that. Seek first the kingdom of God. Just make sure that that anxiety doesn't become self-focused, like how am I going to do? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. After trying, doing, you know, whatever the future holds, and there, there's a lot of plans and things like that that we've got to take care of, do all of that. Go ahead and do all of that. But in the end, after doing so, you can say, you can look at this. And instead of like looking ahead for the future worries, you can say, Lord, thank you. Give us this day our daily bread. I have done all that I can do for today to seek your kingdom first. And I will trust you for tomorrow. That is the pathway to start stepping out of our anxiety-driven life. Seek God first. Seek his kingdom first. And embrace a sacred worry for others. You know, that's a worry of love. That's the sacredness of love. So I want to really encourage, you to encourage our church to do that. Okay, let's pray.